listening to Radio Owl's Nest. The songs of Martin Page, all day, all night, forever. So grab a cup of tea, settle down with us in the Owl's Nest. In the Owl's Nest. Hello everybody, this is Martin Page. You know, just thinking, we've had this theme music for over two years. And I remember when uh, lots of shows like Doctor Who and BBC shows, every now and then, used to change their theme music. But I'm too bloody lazy. So we're going to keep the same uh, theme music. And I asked my manager and a few friends, should we change the music? And they said, oh, no, because they won't know what it is and you'll just be effing about. So (laughs) we're going to keep the same theme music. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Another episode of Radio Wells. Nest. I've got to tell you, when I was a young kid, you know, I'd only uh, stay with certain things for a period of time. If I got a job, I'd stay there for maybe one day or three hours. If I joined a football team, I'd leave them after about mm, an hour. And uh, if I had a girlfriend, I'd hold on to her forever. No, um, but I was always moving around and changing things. And so with Radio Owl's Nest, when I thought I would start it, I thought I'd probably only do one or two shows. Well, here we are. Going into the mammoth, I believe. Uh, Abundance is grace. Who's that? Abundance is forgiveness. Who's that? Abundance is mercy. Uh. Abundance is redemption. Oh, that's the mad nun. Uh... (laughs) I absolutely don't know where that mad nun is. She's probably uh, hovering horizontal above me now. Quite creepy. In the background, you can probably hear my washing being done. Yes, in the Radio Isles Nest, we do everything. We clean clothes. We uh, we wash things as well. That's my laundrette working. Lovely effect. Anyway, let's stop rambling. It's a, We've been going for a while, and I, I was, as I was trying to say to you, I was thinking, I'll do one show. And I'm now saying you have to get 50 shows done. That's what you've got to aim for, Mr. Page. 50. You've gone past 25 and now you're right up there. We've got to get to 50. Uh, Will I make it? I have no bloody idea. But we'll have a go. Uh, My football manager when I was a kid playing for Southampton, he used to say, Consistency, lad. Consistency is everything. See it through to the end. Go the whole 90 minutes or more. So I can remember that and that's what we'll do. We'll aim for the 50 mark. Let's play some music. This is my demos, uh, a, a podcast for songwriters. I go back and I find all the oldies uh, that haven't been played before. Never released, never heard, and I have some fun playing them to you. And I'm going to play you a very rare track written with the great Billy Burnett in the 90s. And he was had just joined Fleetwood Mac. And we know Fleetwood Mac changed their guitarists every 30 seconds. <laughs> The band was always changing. You never knew who was in the band from one day to the other. Well, Billy Burnett was uh, put forward to me by a publisher because uh, Fleetwood Mac had chosen him as a, one of the new guitarists. And they said, go and write with him. And I thought, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Fleetwood Mac, I'd like to get on one of their records. So Billy Burnett, oh, I mean, a yeah, lovely man, turned up in a beautiful Corvette, a real ancient, vi- vintage, beautiful Corvette. And... Um, He had all the uh, trappings of looking like a rock star. I suppose Fleetwood Mac looked for that. And uh, he was just a great, great guy. Guitarist, singer, all-rounder. And he had beautiful hair. I remember that. He was like a rock and roller. The hair was just flowing and pushed back. And we got on. We had a good giggle. And the first song we wrote um, on my 16 track, I had it in the studio, was a song called If I Fall. I'm going to play you the rare demo, the analogue demo now, from a cassette. (laughs) Yeah, remember that. Those. And this is Billy Burnett singing the song.
That's a demo with Billy Burnett back in the 90s, a song called If I Fall. Uh, he was trying to get some songs on the Fleetwood Mac record they were making then after he just joined the band. And uh, we were doing all those harmonies, trying to simulate what the band would actually do. And uh, really great to work with Billy. Um, very easygoing guy. So California. And uh, it was really uh, good to just plug his guitar in and go for it. Um, as you can hear in the background, that is my dryer. That is my dryer drying my clothes. And there's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with its mechanics. And it just keeps on making noises like I've got a slaughterhouse in the back of the owl's nest. But I haven't, so ignore it. It's Just imagine that we're in a, I don't know, a new wave movie with machines moving around, a scientific kind of sci-fi stuff. Uh, I have to dry my clothes. Anyway, that's If I Fall with Billy Burnett, the first demo I'm playing you today. Here are true facts about the owl. The owl's face is basically like a giant ear. The specialized feathers of its facial disc channel sound to its ear holes like a fuzzy satellite dish. It's nice to have the Owl Man back again with all the facts about the owls, isn't it? It's quite nice to have him back. And uh, uh, my face is pretty flat. My eyes are bad. I can't see very well, but my ears are fantastic. So that's probably why I have a flat face and I am related to the wonderful owl heads out there. I'm going to play you something really, really, I keep on always saying this, but this is truly rare. Um, it was a demo I wrote with Bernie Taupin uh, right around the time, just after I'd written We Built This City and These Dreams with him, and we were beginning to uh, learn about each other and write quite a bit of material. And he trusted me, and he was sending me lots of faxes with lyrics on. And this is a song called Ball. Um, and I was, as you can tell with the demo, it was just the first time I was working really on a Fostex 8-track which I'd done the demo for for We Built the City and These Dreams. And so it's uh, you can hear it's a Fostex 8-track quarter-inch demo. But um, I was in the vibe of sort of doing a kind of um, Tears for Fears track. I was really into that triplet rhythm and, and uh, swing rhythm. And uh, I thought the lyrics were fantastic. Anyway, I'll make excuses for the rough demo when we first got together. I was using really bad microphones, bad everything. But I was playing a bit of guitar with a cheap little lamp, and, uh, and I was using my Lindrum and I was using a Jupiter 8 to do everything so let me play you this a demo never ever heard by I don't even think my publisher uh, a demo called Ball Peaceful life. You just keep 
of a song called Ball that I wrote with uh, Bernie Taupin. Uh, listen to that in the background. Listen. <laughs> no, it's, that, that's my dryer. Something's wrong with it. I'm not slaughtering creatures in the background there. No, no, but listen to that. I should actually record that and put it on an ambient record. Uh, please ignore all the paraphernalia sonics in the background, but I've got to dry my jeans. Uh, that's a song called Ball, um, and I wrote that, as I said, with Bernie Taupin, and I, I had a real, for me, sort of 80s uh, Tears for Fears vibe for it. We had a lot of interest in that song. It was circulated uh, around all the record companies, and everybody took interest in it, but nobody recorded it, and... Uh, um, I'm, I'm enjoying listening to it again and all the little keyboard parts. It was around that time, you know, when you had bands like uh, Acadia and uh, but everybody was sampling things. So you would always put a little bit of air and distortion on the keyboard sounds you were doing. And um, I enjoyed looking for those kinds of melodies that, uh, uh, using those kinds of synthesizers that you played with and joined to samples. Um, that's a song, yes, right back in time called Ball. I released my second instrumental um, album uh, back in November 2021 and there's a track on there, the last track, called A Last Look. I was thinking if you knew that you were only able to see something and feel something for the very last time, how your senses would be heightened to take it all in. And so I wrote uh, this track, A Last Look, with that concept in mind. This is from the album called The Occupation of Hope.
That's a track called A Last Look uh, from my album from November 2021. Yes, back there. And um, it was uh, on an album called The Occupation of Hope. I was also reading a book about animals and how sometimes you can tell when they feel like uh, their lives are coming to an end and they start to look um, uh, at walk around the house and check the garden out and tend to take things in a, in a different way and I remember with my cats I used to sense that they were giving a, a last look to all the things that they loved and uh, that's the feeling I got anyway um, wanted to play that to you I thought, yes I did, I actually think now and then, believe it or not, the actual cogs in the brain, uh, just like my washing machine in the background, which is making an awful noise, uh, we should call that room the slaughterhouse. No, we shouldn't, that's horrible. No, 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 no. Um, but my brain sometimes ticks over and I thought, uh, I should tell you some things about me that you probably don't want to know but you might want to know um i remember uh, a great 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 supporter of me joseph kaczynski said you know i missed the quiz <laughs> the poor man the poor man if he missed the quiz i don't know what his life could have been like um extremely boring i would imagine but anyway i thought well um with that little prompt from joseph i thought i would tell you a few things um that you might not know but might find fascinating Okay, number one, number one. What's my favourite key in music? Uh, what's the uh, the key of music that I use most in my songs? What's that, eh? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's E-flat. Yes, E-flat. Um, and Beethoven uh, loves E-flat. Uh, over the years, I've been able to really tell how... Uh, keys in music, tone in music, the keys, the chords you play in a certain uh, key um, affect people and I can hear it and I can hear how um, A sounds different to E flat. E flat has, a, to, for me, a tremendous uh, richness to it um, and, and the corresponding chords B flat, C minor, A flat, there's a deepness, there's a richness in, in, uh, in the tone to me and I can I can feel it, and some of my, uh, my uh, best songs I think I've written, like Fallen Angel for, with Robbie Robertson, yes, E flat, and even Dancing in Heaven with Q Phil, we're talking about A flat and a C minor vibe there, so a lot of my songs <laughs> are written in E flat. I think Robbie Robertson was once interviewed and they said, how come the songs that you write with Martin Page are in E flat, even uh, Sign of the Rainbow on his album Storyville, and he says, I have no idea, but he, everything he brought to me was in E flat. Maybe that's the only key he can play in. Um, <laughs> no, I can play another keys, but uh, uh, E flat is my favourite all-time key to go to because it's rich, deep red, and uh, it vibrates with a earthiness. Okay. Uh, fact number two. Uh, on my album, In the House of Stone and Light, there was a guitarist I was trying to get to play on that album. And uh, I wonder if any of you know the guitarist I was thinking about putting on my first debut album in the House of Stone and Light. Uh, I can't hear you. Speak up. I can't hear you. Well, this is the answer. Steve Hackett uh, from Genesis. Um, I was really wanted to get Steve Hackett uh, on the album. Of course, we had Phil Collins playing some of the drum tracks. And I thought having Steve Hackett would be wonderful. But, but we couldn't get him. Other things were happening at that time for his career. And also, um, that didn't happen. But uh, there you go. Steve Hackett would have been a guitarist I would have loved to have had involved. So there are two facts there. Uh, not quite the quiz, Joseph, yes. But um, I do thank Joseph for actually leading me back to uh, uh, prying into my brain and releasing some things that possibly people aren't aware of. Maybe we'll do another one a little bit later on in the show. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for prompting the old noggin. Listen to that. Can you hear it? <laughs> the dryer in the background. It sounds like <laughs> it's eating my furniture. I'm only drying a couple of pairs of jeans. Can you hear that? It's horrible. It really is a chainsaw massacre. Anyway, um, moving on. Oh, creepy sounds. Ooh. Ah, Simmons drums. This sounds like the 80s meets the 90s. 
with creepy sounds. Anyway, l- l- let's stop this right now so I can explain what we're about to play. Um, funny enough, um, it brings back memories of playing on Ghostbusters because uh, I did all the little weird noises uh, at the beginning and at the end of the track and all through the track and even um, on the film uh, when Sigourney Weaver is lying on a bed and there's a ghost about to, uh, well, actually do some sexual things to her it seems to be but um uh yeah all my little wiggles and everything that ray parker jr told me to do are on uh ghostbusters and um now it's an airplane going over listen to that this studio my goodness me the noises the ambience in this studio um <laughs> uh but i re- well not recently but sometime uh actually i think last year i did an interview for this thing called 80sography and i had to talk about uh ghostbusters and um it brought up all the keyboard parts and uh yes i was very good at doing bends on keyboard parts and uh printing echo and reverbs in the studio anyway this track i'm going to play you which reminds me of me doing wiggling keyboard sounds is called night creatures now you remember at that period i think late 80s beginning of the 90s we had thriller uh with michael jackson and and everything with a little bit of a primitive kind of uh ghostly and otherworldly thing seemed to be in the pop charts somehow um so i wrote this song called night creatures with uh john lind the great songwriter who i I'd met working with Earth, Wind and Fire. Yes, he wrote uh, Boogie Wonderland and he was uh, Madonna's hit, my number one song. He was uh, an incredible writer and uh, he was very interested in working with me because I was still playing around with these synthesizers. So uh, this song eventually got cut by Melissa Manchester and it was George George Duke, yes, that great funk keyboard player that I loved. Uh, he produced it on Melissa Manchester's album. I think it was called Mathematics. Now, this is the demo of Night Creatures and I apologise, I can't remember the lady who sang on the demo. I think John Lind hired her. <laughs> no, it's not funny, that. That is not funny at all. Go away. Um, so, th- I'm going to play you... It's an eight-track demo. <laughs> no, that's not funny either. <laughs> Thank you. Um, n- no! You know, uh, the faders. I have too many faders, and now we have grand music coming up. But well, maybe we should just let it go, because, uh, yes, yeah, going to play you a very, very rare <laughs> demo... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what a vibrato. Uh, so, anyway, uh, let, no further ado, this is the demo of Night Creatures.
Night Creatures Calling. <clears throat> Me with my wiggly keyboards, bending, modulation. And that was a period when I fell in love with a, a diminished chord that I used nearly everywhere. And you can hear that passing in this chorus. Uh, that was a time of Rod Temperton. Remember him, the bloke from Heatwave who wrote all those wonderful songs for Heatwave and Quincy Jones brought over to work with Michael Jackson. And uh, we were trying to touch that uh, spirit of that mood. Um, actually, funny enough, at that time, if you wrote anything that had a creature in it or it had instinct in it, like Animal Instinct I wrote, you had a chance of getting your song cut. Uh, anyway, that was uh, uh, reminded me, uh, we did that with a drum machine, but we made sure that we played the electric uh, fill drums, which were called Simmons, live. And we hit cymbals live as well, so that you could make the drum machine feel like it was being played by a real person. And there was a, a liveliness and a openness and a feel in the track. And that's John Lynn singing some lovely harmonies in the background. And we have, uh, there you are, the premiere, never heard before, the demo for Night Creatures, wiggly keyboards as well. Can you hear that? <laughs> it's getting louder. It's coming through. It's getting nearer to me. It's going to chomp me up my, uh, my washing dryer. Uh, if, if this show ends early, you know what's happened. I've been eaten by the, yeah, <laughs> the washing dryer. Now that's the real sound of an owl. Check this out. Yes? Believe it or not, that's the sound of an owl. And this is. Believe it or not, I want you to learn, learn, listen to the owls. Take it in, children. That's owls at night. Let's hear it one more time. Abundance is grace. No, not Abundance you, not you, the mad nun. Abundance is oh, mercy. Abundance sake. is I've got the gardener now, listen. The gardener's outside blowing bloody leaves. What is it? Listen. Okay, why don't you all come in? I mean, bring the gardener in, bring the mad nun, and bring the damaged dryer in. Let's just finish this now. Uh, that's the sound of a jukebox. This is an effects record, isn't it? At night with crickets. And this is Delta Jukebox from my album, Hotel of the Two Worlds.
fighting horns with my voice. Uh, Delta Jukebox uh, from an album of mine, a solo album called Hotel of the Two Worlds. Uh, there's nothing really quite like a uh, guitar doubling the bass line. Um, there's something about that. They do that in reggae, and I heard that a lot with uh, stable singers. And there's something about the uh, octave range that makes it great. Sorry about the... Uh, the dryer, because it's right behind me now, about a foot away, and it's opening its mouth, it's about to chomp me. Anyway, that's Delta Jukebox. We needed to be levitated, didn't we? And, uh... Ah! It's got my leg! Hi, I'm Trevor Thornton, here with Martin Page in Owl's Nest Radio. I'm the one who sits behind him and plays all the pots and pans and makes all that lousy noise. It's true, it's true. We never gave Trevor a drum kit to actually play, uh, even in the Q-Field days and all the recent stuff. We just gave him kitchen pots and pans. I mean, it's a budget, you know what I mean? You don't want a full drum kit for Trevor. So, uh, yeah, pots and pans, gotta keep the budget down. Anyway, how about the 80s? <laughs> Yes, shall we play a track that reflects the 80s? I have this alter ego band you probably know about, Zeke Monroe and the Flashheads. Here's a brand new song, very 80s. We have Feeway Bill meeting Bella Lugosi again and Paige. This is called I Am Yours. my flaws I am yours ah, I never knew that Bella Lugosi could sing so bloody well and be such a romantic that is Zika Monroe and the Flashheads and a new track that I've just uh, put together called I am yours <laughs> can you still hear it I'm only drying a couple of pairs of jeans and it's been going for over 45 minutes 
Good gracious, what a bloody noise! It is, as I said, uh, a creature eating all my uh, furniture. <laughs> it's eaten my left leg, um, and it's still trying to eat my jeans. I think I need a repair man. When they aren't being quiet, owls make a wide variety of sounds. Perhaps the most famous of these sounds is the woo-woo sound made by some owls. It reminds me of the fairy tale where a young girl is lost in the forest and she sees an owl and asks it, do you know where my mother is? And the owl responds, why the hell would I know where your mother is? Are you stupid? And why are you fairy tale children always getting lost in forests and hallucinating about animals that can talk? And then the owl swooped down and ripped the little girl's face off and ate her eyeballs. And then the owl hooted. Hoo-hoo. It's a German fairy tale, so it's a little dark, I guess. Maybe it's the translation. Nope, not the translation. It says right here, rips her face off. Oh, oh God, there's even a picture. Just remember, don't do drugs, because an owl may just rip your face off. Thank you, Mr. Owlman. Uh, very tasteful, Owlman. Thank you for that. Well, this is a pretty special moment because I did find uh, some four-track demos that uh, Brian Fairweather and myself made in an, a little Islington flat back in London uh, in the uh, late 70s before we even became songwriters. When we were just starting, we had a TAC four-track, we had a Fender Twin Reverb, that uh, which is an amplifier, that everything went through, our vocals, our guitars, our bass, um, us playing drums on our legs with a little tiny little drum machine that we borrowed from somebody. And we were making these demos to try and get a publishing deal. And uh, it eventually uh, led to us, after about a year, getting a publishing deal with Zomba and a record deal with Jive Records. But we were doing all these little demos in my little upstairs flat uh, in this house, uh, 9 Ockenden Road in Islington, yes. I'm sure it's become very famous because that's where we made our noise and started it all off from. But we made all these demos in a very, very small place. And, of course, on a four-track, after you've done a couple of tracks, you've got to bounce it down to one, then do a couple more tracks and bounce it down to one. So you're constantly losing generations uh, on the tape machine, and it gets rougher and rougher, and you have to try and really balance how you're going to do these uh, bounce-downs of tracks. And you have to make sure that... Oh, 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 hang on. Listen, silence. Silence! My jeans are dry! I uh, just wanted to tell you, I can hear that the uh, machine that was uh, eating the world has uh, eventually stopped and it has dried my jeans. I'm so happy. Anyway, back to the four-track demo. I'm about to play you something which was right uh, at the beginning that Brian Fairweather and myself got together um, just before QPhil even, and we started to learn how to write songs together. We just met each other in a band called CMB, the Charlie Mullen Band, and we decided the thing to do is be songwriters. And so we were learning our trade. You'll hear here that Brian's doing some wonderful guitar parts, which sound like a 12-string guitar. And we were really trying to impress everybody. It's a really a naive demo, but you can see really where we're coming from. And again, I feel quite naked tell it, playing this because this is sort of stripping the skin back and saying... Uh, let's let everybody hear everything from where we started. Um, Brian is singing the song, and uh, and we even doubled him, and then I, we did some harmony. So you can imagine we probably bounced tracks down about 3,000 times, and so that's why the quality is so bad. And then it went to a cassette, and <laughs> that's what I'm playing you, the cassette. So this is the original demo of a song called Movie Star when we were just babies trying to learn our trade.
<laughs> yeah, I've got to laugh. I've got to laugh. I remember I, I found this and I played it to Brian. He was in England. And he said, did we really write songs as fast as that? Uh, I mean, unbelievable. Uh, and we have a, a, even a key change there at a mid late that happens after about 15 minutes into the song. Uh, we were learning our trade for sure. And we, everything on this demo went through this amp, a Fender a Twin Reverb amp. And that's a very bright amp. So everything's sounding bright. And we put our vocals through a uh, pedal, a, a flanger, an electric mistress flanger, which, which seemed to double the vocals and helped us out. Um, so every single thing is going through this one very bright amp. That's why the demo sounds so bright. And we knew we had to impress publishers eventually with all kinds of styles of songs. And you're thinking there, that's, we must have been listening uh, to very, very fast music and Elvis Costello and, uh, you know, all the stuff that was happening in London around that time. And uh, when I think back now, you know, our vocals were all done through one microphone live and we used to master down to a cassette deck that was our mastering and to get reverb and echo on our vocals we used a revox studio machine um just to and if you put it into record you could uh, run it uh, at the same time as, ta- as your vocals and you would get a kind of close delay and i'm actually looking at that revox tape machine now because i still have got it and you can hear it there for just a, a brief moment that's the effect we were going for i feel very brave and i'm sure brian does as well although i didn't tell him i was going to play it to you all uh, that we're playing something uh, so raw from the days we thought we want to be songwriters we better teach ourselves and p.s the little drum machine you can hear there's one of the first ever ever drum machines made by roland it's a cr68 and you just had little knobs on it uh, little buttons that you push to do little fills and everything uh, very cute but uh, yes the beginning of time and by the way, um, I've got to say, if you listen to those lyrics, you can tell that we even wrote thinking that a woman would be singing the song or a female version. Uh, so that's Brian being a female and doing it pretty well, I think. Here are true facts about the owl. This owl is an ambush hunter. What makes her so deadly? She's not the fastest, but she has a different advantage. It's stealth, not speed, that makes her lethal. Ah, a female owl. I think that's appropriate after hearing Brian sing as a female. Uh, I'd like to play you something um, I'm just finished. It's uh, a new song, and uh, I feel very uh, good about it. It's a song called Children of the Desert. I'm putting together an album which has the tentative title of Zero at the Bone. It's um, a meditation, really, on the journey that uh, Mexicans have to take uh, across the desert to get across the American border and the suffering and the turmoil and uh, the terror that these people must go through while seeking a new life and a new start. And I wrote it really through the eyes of a child traveling with a parent and um, making this massive, frightening journey and uh, seeking dignity, really, and freedom and a brand new life. So here is a new song called Children of the Desert. I hold my father like an old stone tree I hold my breath folded like silk Until I cannot breathe I hold my father like a soft linen on a shelf A little moth on hot sand You'll learn to hold your breath We are jail Children of the desert We are married to the sun 
we are children of the desert it will be done it will be done I hold my father like a dove to my ribs John to his fragile spine With him I make the trip We are children of the desert We are children of the desert We are married to the sun We are children of the desert It will be done No, no, stay has It will be done And la tensión Everybody, thank you for being with me on this Radio Owls Nest show. I can see that we're at uh, an hour. <laughs> You've had enough of me, I'm sure. That's a brand new song called uh, Children of the Desert. And uh, thank you for letting me play that to you. I've got to say I had a lot of fun on this show, really did. Even though my left leg was eaten by a rampant drying machine, um, I shall be healthy, hopefully one-legged, but healthy for the next show. It just remains for me to say what I usually say. Please be compassionate to the innocent animal world out there. They feel just like us, and we have complete dominion over them, so let's just step back sometimes, think a little bit deeper, and I'm sure we'll be even more compassionate than we are already lots of love to you uh, noble owl heads thank you for joining me today I want to thank uh, Vanessa Levitt for always bringing these big flapping Radio Owls Nest shows to your ears thank you Vanessa so look on the bright side of life stay positive keep listening to the best music you possibly can and I shall definitely see you again in the Owls Nest (laughs) 